My name is Jack. I'm going to be your flight attendant for today. We are going to be playing around with painting in Photoshop. Questions that you all may have before we get started, so I do, so you do know that you're in the right place with options like Julianne Cost speaking at the same time. Questions that you've come with before we get started. She's doing video. She's teaching video right now. Video in Photoshop. No, it's right now. She's teaching again later on as well, I think at 4 o'clock. So actually, if you want, stay here. She's teaching the exact same class at like 4. So whew, I thought there would be a mass exodus. Thank you for reminding me of that, because I'm going, what are you guys doing? I mean, come on. Any other questions aside from Julianne's schedule? I get two classes here, and she's teaching, I think, 14 total. So uh, I'm glad that I have you guys. No questions about painting in Photoshop. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah, and that's awesome. Well, if you are, quote unquote, an artist, which in some ways uh, I think probably we all are, and I'll, you know, hopefully give yourself some slack in terms of that area of what you call yourself. In terms of this class here, this class is a cloning class. You do not need to have artistic skills for this class. This is how you get to cheat and take that photograph and turn it into that using Photoshop. So that is the purpose of the class. I am traditionally trained in terms of my um, painting long before the computer was oils and watercolors and sculpture and stuff. Um, but I don't think most people are not um, great fine artists. Certainly when it comes to a portrait, you'd better be pretty darn good at your painting skills if you want anything to be even vaguely usable for a portrait. This is one of the things that we're going to be doing here, this portrait I was commissioned for, for of Princess Diana. But, um, and I'm going to show you how I did this, but it's going to bring cloning into the equation because I'm not that good. As much as my, I love my oil paint sketches, I am not going to try and sell somebody on a portrait. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing today is um, talking about cloning. So yes, you're, from that standpoint, you're in a good place. I'm also, as part of today, going to be giving you a um, uh, link to uh, PDFs, patterns, textures, brushes, actions to automate this whole process. Because for me to teach you how to paint in Photoshop in one hour is ridiculous. Okay, so basically I'm going to give you a month-long class overview and then give you a ton of free stuff to for have you to be able to play with when you get back to your studio. So that is what, what we'll be doing. Okay, Because one hour is, you know, I can barely sneeze in an hour, let alone teach you how to paint in Photoshop. Yes? I have to leave in like half an hour. Can I get the free stuff to Oh, ha, <laughs> Yeah, good luck. Yes, he's going, <laughs> Julianne, man, can I get, he's going, um, yes, we're going to start off with that. Okay. Um, if you were in my, how many of you were in the class I just did on layer styles, okay, and, and automating and that sort of thing? I'm not going to give that link out because that was a really cool link, but I am going to give the first one out, which is going to give you all my brushes and patterns and textures and painting. So yes, I'll absolutely start off with um, that. Yes, absolutely. Any other questions? How's Max treating you guys so far? Good. I'm going to uh, mention something that I mentioned in the last class that I don't know if you're like me, but as soon as after the keynote, I had every friend in the world, especially since they know I teach, going, what's this about CC, and I have to subscribe, and what about this, and I've been 20 years, and you know, there's, there's a lot of confusion. And one thing that a lot of people don't know, and I don't know why Adobe hasn't announced it more, but there's the option where for 10 bucks a month, a person can buy any one of the Creative Suite and do it. You don't have to do the entire cloud. You don't have to do the whole thing. You don't have to do the 20 or 50 bucks a year. You can do, I think, 995 and pick any uh, program that you want. So that hasn't been public, and it's silly because it defuses, you know, that's less than the upgrade cost per year of upgrading Photoshop for 200 bucks, right? So it's actually cheaper, and you can do it, but everybody in the world is going, Wait, why, why are you doing this? Why are you? And actually, it's a better deal. You know, obviously, if you use more than two programs, then the full suite is a phenomenal deal. But I don't, I don't work for Adobe, um, but I thought I would do that just because if you're like me, you're getting plenty of people saying, you know, the confusion about why I don't need the suite, so why are you forcing it? And they're not. You can do an individual program. Okay. Anything else? I think we're set. We're good, and we're set. 
Good afternoon. That was absolutely pitiful. You guys, some of you have been, already been in my class that I know you just ate, you're in a dark room, you're ready to go to bed, and you're stuck with me for an hour. But I'm still going to force you guys to react to me or else it won't be pretty. Good afternoon. Awesome. Great. Especially since you want to get free stuff from me, you'd better react like that. My name is, and laughter too. Yes, you were definitely were in my last class. Um, my name is Jack. How many of you have heard me speak before? Forget the, this morning. Okay, only a few of you, um, which is great. I, I love new audiences. Um, I wrote the second book in the world on Photoshop. Uh, Bert Monroy wrote the first, rat bastard that he is. <laughs> Loving good friend that he is. The Photoshop Wow books, we've got a, two million books in 12 languages and blah, blah, blah. And um, I love it. My background is in traditional arts and traditional graphic design and traditional advertising. And then in 1984, this thing called a Mac came out. And I was a creative director in Los Angeles here. And I touched it and I go, this is going to change everything. This is going to change the whole idea of computer graphics, especially mouse driven as opposed to command driven. This is going to change everything. Quit advertising, moved down to San Diego, got a house on the beach, did graduate work. And I've been doing teaching and having my own design studio for the last 25, 30 years. But my, one of my first passions was fine art, long before there ever was a computer, before most of you guys were born. And uh, for me, the exciting thing about this class right here is the fact that if you know some little secret, you know, jiggery pokery, you can actually do some amazing natural media with Photoshop. As a matter of fact, you've been able to do natural media in Photoshop for a decade. The problem is, is that it's not an intuitive way um, of painting in Photoshop, especially when it comes to cloning something, right? Because there are no cloning features. It's not, you know, Corel Painter that has it built in, and they call it a cloning brush, right? There is no cloning brush in Photoshop, and so most people don't know that you can clone. Adobe has done this specifically so I can sell product. Awfully nice of them. They hide all these really cool features so people like myself can make a living teaching. You poor bastards. <laughs> <coughs> so, um, but I love it. And I love it because I think you can do some great stuff. And with the mixer brush technology that's come in since um, uh, CS5, you can do some wonderful, wonderful stuff in terms of imitating um, natural media. I thought these were my high res slides, but they're not. Uh, You are not the high res slides I thought you were. You can do some uh, really expressive or um, organic looking portraits in Photoshop. So with that, considering that we only have an hour, let's get started. Let's start off with um, giving you, since I may not go back to this image, this is a little teeny plastic toy I shot at uh, Comic-Con uh, last year in San Diego, a little Darth Maul shot. And um, I wish it was the full res because you know being able to I can fake it that way. Um, what you're seeing, is these are individual hand brush strokes, okay? but they are based upon the little photograph that I tweaked. And um, so I'm letting Photoshop do all my color mixing for me. But I'm still using traditional painting techniques, as in this case, I'm using a what's known as a complementary ground. There's one technique in painting where you start off doing an underpainting of the opposite color scheme of what you're working on. And then you do your regular painting on top of that, allowing portions of this underpainting to show through. And if you have complementary colors, like the blue and the red, what that does to your rods and cones is basically gives them a little drug trip. Right? It's a little you know, mushroom high for your eyes. And that's something that's been done in traditional painting for a long time. So I use that, because that's something how I paint traditional oils. Right? So I bring that over into my um, digital paintings. And uh, let me just bring up Princess Die, which we are going to uh, take a look at. And I think, is this one full res? No, it's not. Um, but this right here um, is, again, done in Photoshop. But a lot of this one right here is done with smoke and mirrors. Okay, One of the things that we're going to do here is I'm going to show you how, if you have um, CS6 or the new CC, there's an oil paint filter in there, which is awesome. And if you know the Secret Mickey Mouse Club handshake, you can actually do a, quite a nice little painting in about half a second. 
and I'm going to give you all that stuff that will automate the process. So, okay. So, it's very cool. I'm very glad to be here. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Let's start off with um, that link for you guys. Um, yeah, it's something to do with the monitor. Actually, these are higher res files, but they're not coming up. Okay, so here's some things for you guys. If you've got your proverbial phone, take a picture. It's the easiest way. It'll last longer. Um, I've got my Facebook fan page, Jack Davis Wow. If you like that page, you're probably familiar with that concept, the little star that says freebies will come up. So like the page, you'll see a little star that says freebies. Click on that, and you will get a whole set of presets related to painting. You'll also find some other free, fun stuff there. Great, cool, awesome. Um, this was actually, you, you could, I think you can actually go to um, creativelive.com if you're not familiar with them. They're a great group. Um, I've got some really fun classes coming up with Creative Live. They had a, a Photoshop week um, that was put on probably two months ago. And as part of that, I did a whole session on painting in Photoshop, actually what we're doing here. So you can um, get that session, um, uh, whatever it is. I'm sure it's real cheap because it's just a partial session. And I originally put these presets up for that class, so that's what you're getting. Um, on that same one, there's a little, I also teach iPhonography. How many of you consider yourselves iPhonography freaks? That Only a few of you. Oh, dude, babe, whatever. Snapseed, all of you, every single one of you should download Snapseed right now for your iPhone, your iPad, your Android, whatever. Snapseed, Google bought it. They paid $100 billion for this one little app so they could give it away to you free. Snapseed, awesome, phenomenal piece of software for both desktop as well as mobile devices. There's my iPhoneography tip. Uh, the main thing here in terms of um, excessive zoom is the uh, wowcreativearts.com. That's where I have um, my Lightroom training and stuff like that that's relevant. I mentioned this to the last class, and somebody said that this URL wasn't working, um, which is depressing. I only put on one event myself um, every year, and that's called Creative Photography for the Soul over in Hawaii. If you have any interest in coming over to Hawaii this fall, myself and two National Geographic photographers and shooting your head off and eating and drinking and doing stuff, you can give me a business card and I'll send you an invitation if you're interested. Just write Hawaii on a business card. Okay, this at that first um, website, you will, yeah, it's, it's the monitor is what's, it's the monitor setting. Um, you will find this there, how to paint with WOW paint and clone presets, and I'm giving you all the presets. This is a, a PDF that will walk you through the process of what I'm going to be doing today. So in terms of taking notes, the first part of it is set. I'm going to end with something that's not on this PDF, and that's using the mixer brush. The mixer brush is extremely cool and groovy. That came in with um, CS6. CS5, actually, CS6, it was augmented with erodible tips and things like that. It's also not meant for cloning. Um, it can do some smudging. I'm going to give you a little tip um, at the end of today that will allow you to do um, amazing stuff like that Darth Maul and Princess Diana stuff with it. So that is not part of that um, preset right there. Um, so there you go. Basically, to load presets in, as with any presets in Photoshop, if you don't know it, what you simply do is you take any preset, whether it's an action or a pattern or a texture or a brush, put that into the presets folder within Photoshop. You don't have to put brushes and brushes and textures and textures and that. Just put anything at that top level of presets in Adobe's own application folder. Restart Photoshop, and they'll all show up in the right place. Okay? They will be accessible within Photoshop and I'll show you where to find them. Okay, so that's how you're gonna load them. Okay, next. This is so strange. It's something to do, obviously, with, I think, the, um, the retina display, and we're using an HDMI um, projector. Um, so here are your steps. If you've got your phone out, you can shoot this right here, and this will give you the basic steps for painting. There are three main ways to paint in Photoshop. Under the step three here, you'll see the art history brush, the pattern stamp tool, 
and the mixer brush. Those are the three main ways of cloning a photograph in Photoshop. All of these basic steps work the same way no matter what technique you're going to do. So that's what this slide is about. First off, of course, is why would you paint okay, in the computer? Um, very good question, especially if you're starting with a good photograph to begin with and we're talking about cloning. Why would you paint? You already have a pretty picture. So if you're trying to do photorealistic paintings from a photograph, talk to Bert. You better be a psychotic, anal retentive, brilliant master at painting to do photorealistic paintings. So the reason why I paint in a computer is to do an expressive interpretation of a scene. Right? It could be that my original is so bad that I need to extend it. It needs to be embellished because it's not usable. It doesn't tell the story. I was in Tahiti, but it was an overcast, rotten day, and it just does, I, I have no desire to ever look at that photograph again. It does not tell the story when I was on that bay in, in Tahiti. It's a wonderful shot of the bride, but you're not going to put it above the mantel place because it wasn't that good of a shot. A photograph gives you the ability, the freedom, to take and do an interpretation. So most of the stuff you saw in terms of the paintings would border on what would be called impressionistic. Right? They are an elaboration, an embellishment of the photograph, which means that you can muck about with it. You can change your saturation or color tone or vignette or composite in. The little shot of uh, Tahiti that you may have noticed with the peaks and the canoe in the front, front of it, there was no canoe in that shot. I took a shot from a canoe on another day, put it in there, slapped it in, did the roughest little selection ever, made the source photograph, and then did the painting. So that would be another reason why you would paint is because your source material that the client has given you is what's technically known as crap, right? <laughs> so having the flexibility to paint that, to do an interpretation of it, to do something expressive, allows you to use something and tell the story. It all comes down, as you know, to the story. The reason why you do anything is to strengthen your visual communication challenge, whatever that is, about a company, product, service, event, or whatever. OK, the steps are, one, enhance, embellish, elaborate using Adobe Camera Raw, Lightroom, or Photoshop. If you were in my previous class, I mentioned that 90% of your work with any photograph, or even texture, or backgrounds, or anything, should be done in Adobe Camera Raw, or Lightroom if you're a Lightroom user. You should never be doing color, tone, contrast, curves, black and white, tinting, even skin softening, vignetting, any of that should ever be done in Photoshop ever, ever again. God made Adobe Camera Raw for a reason. And it's because it's bitchin', it's quick, it's easy, it's non-destructive. You can share whatever you do to one image to 50 images. Photoshop is for doing your collage work, your filtering work, your video work now, obviously your web design and creating all your components. It's not for fixing images. There's no reason. It takes you 10 times as long in Photoshop. And you actually get less quality than if you do it in Adobe Camera Raw. I'll do a little start off in that, but there's my thing. And you can totally go beyond the capture in Adobe Camera Raw to do amazing stuff. Prepping your brushes in Canvas. Okay, the thing about brushes, I'm giving you tons of brushes for being here today. I could do an entire month-long session on creating brushes because there's quite an art to it, especially when you get into e either the mixer brush and you have these real 3D simulated brushes and bristles and how they interact, or the standard brush tips that have been around in Photoshop for a long time that include things like dual tips where you have two different footprints that you've captured and you allow Photoshop to um, organically jitter, what they call jitter, and change on the fly. So you no longer have a synthetic brush that every time you do a stroke is exactly the same, the problem with computer brushes. Every single time you do a stroke, there's a variation in it just as there would be in a real brush. So a dual tip, I'll walk through a little bit of that. One of the main things about a, a good brush in Photoshop is going to be taking the texture, the faux texture, that's what we're trying to do is right, fool the eye. Anytime you do a digital painting, you're usually trying to imitate an analog process. The way you imitate that, the way you fool the eye into thinking that it's an analog painting is texture. Okay? The viscosity of the paint and the texture that it's being applied to. You put the same texture that you're going to do below the painting into the brush, and then that brush will actually skip over the texture as if it actually was interacting with some sort of um, real surface. And um, so I've given you a ton of textures, and all my textures are built into my brushes, so I've given those to you as well. 
Continuing on, load your photograph into the brush. That can be done in the three different ways. One, the art history, it's making what's known as a snapshot, a merged snapshot. We won't really do with art history that it's in the PDF. It's the most demonic way of painting in Photoshop. It's demonic because it actually does the brush strokes for you. When you touch down an art history brush on the canvas, it actually will start tracing the contours of areas of contrast that you're on. So a person who's a real painter sees the brush doing brush strokes for you, and it is kind of this demonic possession, head spinning, spewing green stuff kind of thing. For those of us who are not uh, quote unquote real painters, it's cool because they're actually going to give you some brush strokes. It's really nice for like a pastel or a chalk. Um, not the long brush strokes, but things like chalk and pastel, the art history brush is good. My um, presets include art history presets for you. The pattern stamp tool, the thing, the pattern stamp tool is the only place with what's known as the impressionist setting in Photoshop resides. It's been in Photoshop for 100 years. It's moved to different spots. To be honest, Adobe doesn't even know what they have because it's so bitchin'. It's what allows you to say, take this photograph. I want the color and tone and all that stuff, but not the detail. My brush stroke will actually, I want you to mix the paint for me, do everything for me, but I'm going to do the own, my own brush strokes. The pattern stamp does that. The watercolors of that canoe that was on that, the shoreline there with that, all the watercolors should be done with the pattern stamp. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's wonderful. The reason why it's hidden and nobody knows what it's, how to use it is what you have to do is get all your photograph once you've enhanced it, select all, edit, define pattern. Your entire photograph needs to be a pattern, and that can then be loaded into the uh, pattern stamp tool. And now you can paint with the photograph. Awesome, cool, groovy. I've given you stuff. The PDF goes into that in detail. The mixer brush. The mixer brush is the new stuff, as I mentioned, that came in with CS5. Cool, 3D brush trips, mushing, viscosity, gorgeous, wonderful, awesome. No cloning capabilities. Okay? So the closest thing you can do is what they call um, sample all layers. So you have your photograph, you have an empty layer on top, you smudge. If you turn on sample all layers, you get the smush of what you did down here. The problem is, as soon as you do a secondary brush stroke, you're now smushing the smush. It's sampling all layers, including what you just painted. So you end up getting what you'd get in the real world. If you do a paint stroke over a paint stroke, it'll start becoming muddy. Okay? So it, it, you, that means with a mixer brush, what most people do with paintings is do all these little teeny tiny brush strokes really slowly, p painfully, laboriously, and you smudge a painting into submission. Painful and slow. You can't do an entire brush stroke because it's sampling all layers. It's a very slow process. I'm going to give you a bug that's in Photoshop that allows you to turn off sample all layers and still sample all layers, okay? which allows you to work fast, quick, easy. I've written you an action, a 4,000 step action, which will actually automate the entire process for you. You'll be all set, good to go. You have brushes. It automatically chooses the brushes. It makes the layers. It names them. It walks your cat, washes your dishes. It's great. <laughs> That's the only way I can teach the mixer brush in the time that we have. OK. Four, block in the shapes. This goes into the painting, block in the shapes, usually from your darks to your lights. Five, refine, pull back in detail. Start off rough and continue to fine tune it. Again, something you can't do with the traditional mixer brush, because if you smush, as soon as you cover up your painting with a nice rough underpainting, you can't. That's all you're going to do is smush or smush. Six, enhance the tactile effect. This is really where the trompe l'oeil, the imitation of natural media comes in, is adding the texture that is going to be your substrate, your, your medium you're painting on, put it into the brush, and then you add that texture back on top of the process. It completes this fooling the eye, suspending disbelief that the person is looking at something digital. So that's the last step, and that includes things like patinas and sharpening and things like that. Okay. So that's everything there. OK, let's just get into painting because, OK. So first off, um, painting in Adobe Camera Raw. First off, uh, talking about enhancing. Here, if you were in my first class, we talked about this is the original shot, South Florida, nice art deco. This is the shot. This is doing a little color and tone tweak to it. I still have some distractions in here. This is doing the retouching here in ACR. Now ACR, the new ACR, which will be part of CC, as well as in the new Lightroom, has got some significant retouching tools. 
awesome, cool, groovy, all sorts of special effects that you can do. This would be an example of um, enhancing that first step I gave you in that outline of enhancing it before I painted it, right? Because I'm cloning from it, it's going to pull the exact colors that I see here. And in an example, I'll just, you know, do it from scratch. If this is my original, you could start off, hit auto. You could come up here and do edge clarity, which is going to do some popping on the edge. Your shadow slider is worth about $10 billion. It is awesome. You can come up here and add our vibrance. We can go crazy because of our knowing that we're painting it. I'm now fine tuning the color, the, the temperature to pull out the distinction between the purple and the blue, as opposed to here where everything's kind of blue. Okay? And then I can add something like vignette. If we were doing a regular class on ACR, we'd come into something like that. So basically, those steps right there was auto is a great place to start. Shadow is going to save your butt in amazing ways. Clarity is your edge contrast that's going to give you pop, especially really cool and groovy in paintings. And then vibrance is great because that's, of course, is intelligent saturation. It takes what's unsaturated and balances it out with something that's already saturated as opposed to regular saturation, which would take this up and what was already saturated, and this goes screaming to its death out of reproducibility and good taste. Okay, so that is the sort of thing. The other thing that you can do, and I showed this in the last class, is um, where you can take something like this. This is the original shot, okay, and do your color and tone, do a little dodging and burning on the eyes, and then do something. This is the trick that we did in the last class. Do a little black and white treatment, and then come up into where I didn't really do a black and white treatment. All I did is I desaturated in this HSL panel. So again, I'm not going into how to enhance, but I'm just saying however you enhance it, you know, enhance it. In this case, this is what's known as the HSL panel. I took all the saturation down to minus 100. I didn't click on convert to grayscale, so that, that would mean that there was no color. The great thing about using this as a technique for black and white conversion is I can come back, back in here and just resaturate certain colors. Okay? It's very nice. Um, and you can do it, and of course, any time you do, my automating class we just did, any time you see something vaguely useful, so if I come over here and there is my black and white, I just did that, I spent all this time converting it to black and white. Come over to your presets tab, click the button, say, please save my HSL settings, call it DSAT, and you never have to do that again. You now have a custom black and white conversion preset that not only does a beautiful black and white, but you can also come up there and um, give yourself instant color, okay, like I'm doing here. Or you can use the targeted adjustment tool and go into luminosity. You can say, I want a lightened skin tone. I want a darkened skin tone. Give her a tan. Okay, This is what we were doing earlier. Same thing. I come over here. I can come over here. And with luminosity, I can you know, darken down the blues. I can lighten up the purples. Okay, I can lighten up yellows. I can darken the blues. Okay, HSL is mind-bogglingly, freakingly awesome, cool. You missed my class this morning. I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, but here, what have we got going on here? Let's go back to our painting. This right here is the world's most beautiful mother, a real shot from the 40s. And I want to do a painting. So one of the easiest ways for you to do a painting is to come over here. Go over to your adjustment brush in ACR. Works the same way in Lightroom. If you're using Lightroom, the develop module in Lightroom is exactly the same as um, the uh, Adobe Camera Raw in terms of what it can do. And I'm going to come over here. And there's this one little thing down here, this little swatch. Let me turn on my green. This color, okay, if I come over here and click this, and if I click the plus or minus, it resets all the sl other sliders, so that's good to know. So I've got that color. And that is actually is a beautiful, subtle, transparent tint overlay, that color right there. So if I come over here and let's say that I want something that would be kind of a skin tone color, I can come over here and we'll take and we'll hide that green so you're not confused about that. We'll take up the size of our brush, the square bracket keys. If you're not familiar with that, in both Photoshop, ACR, and Lightroom, the square bracket keys changes the size of your brush. Shift square bracket changes the hardness of the brush, again, both in Photoshop and in Adobe Camera Raw. So I've got a big, soft brush. 
Another thing that's built into Photoshop, if you hold down the Option key on the Mac or the Alt key on the PC, it automatically switches you over to the eraser. So you can both paint and erase. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand tint this photograph. So I'm just going to come over here and do the painting. And what I recommend when you hand tint, and I'm going to hold down the Option or Alt key and get that eraser, okay, and that's a little bit, let's zoom in. So let's go back over that. We'll zoom in even closer. Is, and this is, for those of you who do interface design, you'll notice that the brush, as I zoomed in, did not get bigger. Right? It is an intelligent brush where it goes, you zoomed in. I bet you didn't want a bigger brush. Right? You want a big brush, stay zoomed out. You want a small brush, you zoom in, it stays the same relative size, even though the slider doesn't move. And now I can you know, um, erase. And I'm going to scale that. Let's do that same trick in terms of the hardness of the brush. So this is the eraser, and I just went over the eyes, and now I'm erasing. So there's a tip for you. Oftentimes, rather than um, paint with some sort of you know, anal retentive detail, it's much easier to do one big, quick paint and then use your eraser to do your detail work. But anyway, so that right there is the skin tone. And what I'm going to recommend when you do hand tinting is do it the way it was done at the turn of the century, meaning it was done with a very limited palette, quick, sloppy, the colors overlapped. You had a bunch of gold miners sitting out the door, Civil War soldiers. They all needed a little color photograph. You did the tinting, and you moved on. Maybe half a dozen at most colors. If you can't hand tint a um, photograph in about 30 seconds, you're probably spending too much time. If you're trying to make it look like a color photograph, you're probably starting with a color photograph. You know, turn it into black and white, and then you can come over here, and then again, we'll do something like a green background. That's an obnoxious green, so let's do, you know, something like that. <coughs> Big brush. Here is my background, and again, oftentimes that. Good, great, new here. Blue, that oftentimes for hair, what they would do for black, if you remember. If you know Superman, Superman always had blue hair because there was no such thing as you know, black hair. You'll notice that the colors are overlapping. If I want, you can go back to any of these colors. As you hover over any of these pins, it shows you kind of like layers. If you haven't used targeted adjustments in ACR, it's just like layers in the sense that I can come over here if I'm getting a little too much green in the hair. Okay, if I got a little sloppy, then I can just you know, go back to that area. Last thing that I'll do here, maybe I'll go back to the blue and we'll put the slight blue. You'll notice that it's just tinting where there are pixels. Where there are no pixels and it's pure white, it's not doing any effect because it's only affecting where there's already tone. So it's a beautiful transparent tint. Last thing I'll do, I'll say new, light. We'll take some you know, obnoxious red and I'll go tap, tap, zoom in on the lips. Okay, the brush stays small, we'll get a little bit smaller. Okay. And if I get a little carried away, we'll just do that for good enough for government work. And uh, okay. And because you can change anything after the fact, I can go, okay, that's a little bit excessive, so I can come over here. You have saturation and hue. You can go from street walker to subtle. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Mom, I didn't mean it. So literally, you can, and you actually are doing hand tinting. The nice thing about this is when a person sees this, reads it, they know a computer didn't do this, right? Because it's not following some little formula. Um, and yet, it would be sold as a hand tinted effect. So whether you're using a, something like this to tie in a series of images together, you're doing a website or something like this, it's a wonderful way to do that. And again, it can be done for something like this. So here's an original black and white. This is over in Hawaii where, where I do that event. The other thing that's great about using this technique is when you do something like an area, here's the sky, not only do you have the color, but you also have things like clarity and tone. So if I take clarity up, the clouds pop. If I take clarity down, they're now thrown into the background. If I want that dark, that sky, I have obviously my exposure and every other slider. So what would be done in a half a dozen layers in Photoshop if I want to take the church, I really wanted the little Tijuana purple in there, and I want it to actually have, you know, 
be a lighter pastel purple. I want to add clarity to do almost an art deco edge to it. You have an incredible amount of flexibility that you don't even have in Photoshop without doing half a dozen layers for each one of your little brush strokes. So hand tinting, your first step, ACR, awesome. The main thing is this right here. Do it quickly, limited number of colors. It's beautiful, it's great, it's non-fattening, cool. Okay, got it? Next, what we're gonna do, and, and uh, here's Princess Diana. Here is the shot that I was given by the royal family, so to speak, the original shot. In terms of enhancing, I did a vignette and I did some dodging and burning the eyes. I exaggerated the shot because I'm doing a painting. I'm not trying to imitate a photograph. Okay, I continued on. Here's now we're doing color and tone in the eyes, her beautiful blue eyes. Okay, coming up here, this is the um, full color. That was, this is actually the, the seated pose that I worked, started from. I did a seated one. Here's the enhancement. This is the exact same shot. These are snapshots in Adobe Camera Raw. The great thing about snapshots, you just click this little dog-eared page. Anything that you do in ACR or Lightroom is saved with the file. Do any, as many experiments as you want, fool around, explore creative options, click the snapshot. It saves with the file for life. It's permanent, has everything in it. It's wonderful, okay? If you want, if you go, hey, there's six things in here I want to show the client. Do six snapshots, say okay, go back down to the bridge, do Command D or Control D, make six copies open them all up in ACR, guess what? Each one of those has all the snapshots. The six copies, you just turn on snapshot one, go to the next one, snapshot two, snapshot three, you're done, you've got six things ready for output, okay? Or shown to client. In this case, this is just to show you how far I'm pushing that enhancement to really make a source file for the painting. So we'll do this right here. So here's the before and after in terms of how far I push that, okay? You're gonna do the same thing in here. We'll do a painting of this motorcycle. Here's the original. Here is how far it can be pushed in Adobe Camera Raw. No filters, no third party, no layers, no nothing. This is using that same concept of shadows, clarity, vibrance. It's awesome. If you have not spent time in Adobe Camera Raw or, or Lightroom, you should. So this, the ability this, I used to teach how to do uh, HDR, combined bracketed exposures. The fact that you can do that with one file, with no filters, no bracketed exposures, is bitchin'. Okay, we're gonna do a painting from this. We'll do the same one here. Again, if you're used to, you know, doing something like this, here's original shot. You can see, you know, we've got rash and everything like that. This is retouched in Adobe Camera Raw. I'm looking at the exact same raw file down here. This is a DNG raw file. Okay, we could go into how far you can retouch. I'm actually, if you're interested, you should be using Lightroom if you do photography. June 3rd at creativelive.com, June 3rd, I'm doing a whole day class on graphic design. My first time I've done Essentials of Graphic Design, which is gonna be everything from gestalt pattern recognition to contrast, color, tone, storytelling, unique selling proposition. It's gonna be really fun. June 17 through 19, I'm doing a three-day course on Lightroom 5 on how to enhance, retouch, um, special effects all in Lightroom. That class actually is totally per pertinent to ACR users because the develop module, which is where I'm hanging out for three days, is exactly the same as the engine in ACR. So that, if you want, you're welcome to join me. I'm going to do a painting of this as well. I don't think I'm going to get to that one. So what I'm going to do is we'll take... Princess Diana, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down the command key. I'm going to bring these into Photoshop. Uh, actually, before we do that, here is original shot, okay, black and white, and this is the hand tinting. Okay, so oftentimes you're going to be starting with a full color image that you want to do an effect of. So that would be an example of not just an antique shot, but a full color shot. Okay, so let's take this shot. And this shot, and this shot, and this shot. And here's a little tip. Down here in the lower right of ACR, you'll notice as a default it says open images. When it says open images, it will rasterize the image, whether it was RAW or JPEG or TIFF. It will cook all the settings that you've done and open up a regular good old fashioned dumb pixel layer in Photoshop. Right? That's what you normally typically work with. If you hold down the shift key in ACR, it switches over to open objects, which means it's going to open it up as a smart object, which means that everything that you've done in Adobe Camera Raw is going to follow into Photoshop, and you can change it later. 
meaning I can do a full color painting or I could do a painting of a black and white, do it in Photoshop, go, you know what? I'd love to see that black and white painting in full color. You've already finished the painting. You can turn it into color after the fact back because you can still get back to your original if you open up as a smart object. Smart objects are incredibly cool and groovy. You're going to see in a second, I'm going to use that. I'm going to use smart objects to do a painting. So open objects is that's if you hold down the shift key. A little tip also is if you click on this little, looks like a hypertext link, you can turn it on so as a default, it always opens up your images as smart objects. Okay, and this is where you change your color space, your bit depth, you know, everything that's associated with the file. Those are known as your workflow options. They're down at the bottom of ACR. There are something, the uh, same thing in preferences in Lightroom where you can access them. Okay, so I'm going to turn that off because most people have it off. Hold down the shift key, click. It's going to open all these as smart objects into Photoshop CC. We will use the beta for this. Actually, we won't because the beta for this, I have not put in all my presets, and we're going to use the presets that I've given you guys. So we will back out. Don't save D, D, D. You hopefully know that D, and I'm going to just take, they're still selected, and I'm going to drag them over into Photoshop. Uh, let's see. Tools, have I got? I don't have Dr. Brown services. Hopefully you all know that um, RussellBrown.com, two S's and two L's, write that down. Russell, the maniacal genius, creative director for Adobe, has tons of free scripts and free training. And he has some really, really cool, his image processor um, script, which is free, is awesome and fantastic. And it's going to allow you to output all the millions of images you do in Photoshop much easier and better. So get it. It's awesome and it's fantastic. RussellBrown.com, two S's and two L's, R-U-S-S-E-L-L, -L, Brown.com. Awesome. Tell him I sent you. Um, so, and he has uh, something, Dr. Brown Services is what it's called, and I don't have it um, on here because I'm actually in Bridge CC, and that's why it's not in here. And... Uh, uh, you can't right click and open with as a smart object. Um, and this is still going to open up in there. I can open up into, into six, and I'll do that. I'll just I'll switch them into smart objects. Yeah, you see, it, it knows that these are raw files, and it's going to force that into it. So I'm going to do this. One second, please. Here we go in Finder. And take these and drag them over my regular bridge and open up regular Photoshop. Sorry that I didn't put in all those presets before. And we've got these exact same files. And here, and here, and here. We don't want that one. We'll do that same. Commander Control R is a great one. I can bring up all these images, open objects. It's now going to bring them into regular CS6. It's fine. And they're going to come in as smart objects, as I mentioned, which means that they're intelligent. A smart object, the great thing about if you guys have not been using it, let's say that you do your interface um, templates in Illustrator. You take advantage of all the vector tools. If you open up your Illustrator files into Photoshop as smart objects, you can filter, tweak, even distort, camera warp, do whatever you want. When you're done, you go, you know what? I want that type to be different than that. Double click on it, takes it back to Illustrator, reset the type, close it, comes back to Photoshop, reapplies all your filters, and you're done. Smart objects are really, really cool. In this case, I'm going to use it for taking this file, and I'm going to turn this into a painting. So your first thing in Photoshop that I'm going to give you is actually a filtering technique, taking advantage of the new filters that came in with CS5. CS6 is where it was first come in, as it was known as the filter oil paint. Okay, Filter oil paint. Their new stuff is put up here at the top. But in this case, I want to do more than just the oil paint. The oil paint, you've probably seen samples of it. I like pushing it a little further. So I've made an action that actually is going to stack 
half a dozen different filters on top of each other, creating what I call a recipe or an oil paint recipe. I've given you, as part of being here today, an action that does that. These painting actions sampler is what you get as part of those presets that I mentioned to you. And this one right here, well, smart object painting one, I'm actually finishing a, a complete title on uh, painting in Photoshop, so these are, some of these are betas. Um, wow, smart object painting, one. So you take that action, I'm sure you know how to run actions, you click on it, you hit the play button, and it does this. And you go, what did it do? It did this. Yeah. So before, after, before, after. And it's non-destructive. It's a smart filter recipe. It actually put all of that inside the layer. And every one of those elements you can change. Okay. And the reason why I didn't just use the oil paint filter, and I'm just going to, again, for time's sake, I'm going to explain it to you, but you have this action and you can dissect it. Please don't rename it and sell it on eBay for 20 bucks as your own, though you would be smart if you did. I know you won't do that. <laughs> the median is like a smart, um, a smart blur. It allows you to get rid of subtleties and keep edges sharp. So I start off with that to simplify the process. It's part of that enhancing. Two, oil point. The oil paint, I will double click on it to show you the dialog box. And it's really, this is where the kind of the magic comes in in terms of the imitating um, brush strokes. Okay, so here, um, if we take our stylization down, this is where it's going to start you know, doing brush strokes. It's really cool. The formula that you want to know, again, that I'm giving to you already, is take pretty much all your settings all the way up on the right, take your lighting all the way down on the left. So that's all you need to write in your notes is you take your, your stylization is you know, how much detail you want. Okay. The one thing I'm going to recommend why I put this shine in angular direction down is as a default it does this, okay, which is kind of cool and you can maybe get away with a landscape or a little puppy dog pictures that I'm sure you've seen, but that's not how you would really paint. You wouldn't do that. right? You do have brush strokes and you do want to see thickness, what's known as impasto in painting. I do it after the fact with one of those other filters I stack. So I don't do this, and therefore I don't have this sort of distraction. That is the shine is the specular highlight on what's technically a bump map. Okay? So I have just minimal you know, shine in there if you want. But the kind of airbrush, really it's more of a thick brush stroke. It's a, it's a thick wet on wet painting technique is what it's doing. But it is, it's nice and organic. In some areas, you can look at it, you go, man, that's bitchin', right? We, you know, slightly overusing that term, but man, it's really cool. And the nice thing is, of course, is that you could do two different flavors of this painting and then use a mask, say, on this area, I like the brush strokes, and this area, I don't like the brush strokes. So that's also something to keep in mind. There are some areas where you have that stylization down and it's following details, and then another one, you want it up. Okay, so you have that. But basically, the, all your settings are over on the right at the top, and the ones are down at the bottom down here. Okay? And then the other things that I do is, since I have that shine down, I use the emboss filter. The emboss does a little raise, but it's doing it to what's left. So it finds the areas of contrast and does a little raise. These two filter galleries, what is now known as filter galleries, the two that I'm using here, are known as rough pastel. That's giving us the skipping of the paint across the surface. Okay? So if we take it up here, the rough pastel is giving us that irregularity, that texture I mentioned before. Rough pastel, the other one, the last one is texturizer. Again, you've got all of these textures, what's adding the uh, canvas texture to the background. So all of those combine to go from there to there. Now this, for Princess Diana, I actually use this recipe mostly for her face, where me trying to do an interpretation of the subtleties of the personality of face is a challenge. So I use this for face, and then I use the mixer brush for the expressive brush strokes in her dress and other things like that. But let me just show you that one of the cool things about this. If I do one formula, okay, here's my motorcycle, 
I can simply take whatever recipe you come up with. Remember I mentioned, if you ever do anything that's cool, figure out how to replicate it. To replicate this on Princess Diana, I just simply drag it from one document to another, let go, and I'm done, without writing an action or doing anything else. Because now she has the same recipe. Okay, It's cheating. I know. It's cool. You have this action. You have your own smart filter recipe. You can see what's going on in the face. And you can see um, also, in that case, I masked out where I did not want all that sort of stuff going on. It was more than I needed. The great thing about smart objects is they all come with a free, no cost, no obligation layer mask built into them. Right? Layer mask, temporarily hide or show, whatever you're painting on. So if I go to a good old-fashioned paintbrush, a okay, nice big soft brush, and I want a little bit more detail, let's say, in the eyes, take a black brush. That's just like any layer mask. Black will hide, and white's going to reveal. So I take a brush, take down the opacity to something like 30. I can bring back in more detail in the eyes, okay? and I'm maybe in some areas where it's getting a little bit too expressive. Bring it back into the lips. Okay? So you can fine tune where you want the brush strokes by using the layer mask that's built into it. If I were to go back on the motorcycle, it may be the same thing where I come over here to the motorcycle, and I don't want the logo to be that expressive. Click here with my brush, and I can bring in more detail on something like that. Okay. Because whoever you're doing the portrait for had better be able to read the logo on the bike, because they've got an issue, a love affair with that bike. Okay. So that is Smart Filter Recipes. It's stacking it. If you haven't worked with smart filters in general, the whole concept of smart objects, they are awesome, they're great, they're wonderful. And again, in this case, I think you can do some really neat stuff in terms of that. But you're going to want to stack it because by itself, if you just do the brush strokes, you're not getting the texture, and that's what we talked about before. OK, let's go ahead. Um, they can be whatever size that you want. You, in terms, it is a good question. When you get into things like the texture, when you're imitating canvas, let's say you're going to print onto a canvas wrap, something like that, you're going to want the size of your warp and woof of the canvas to match what you're going on. So again, there's the, men, the mental thing. All my textures that I'm giving you all are set up for a 225 PPI file. That's what I scanned all my textures at. 225 is more than enough for most print applications, whether offset or G clay. So at 225, my textures actually match up with true canvas and watercolor and everything like that. So very actually, it's a very good question. Um, so we could do that. Let's actually do this. So let's do, in our time, let's actually do that uh, mixer brush. I was going to do the, the pattern stamp, but again, you've got a PDF that um, goes through that, and it's awesome. So let's do this one right here to do the mixer brush. This is the pattern stamp I mentioned, so this is the watercolor using pattern stamp. I want to show you, since I don't have any, there's no PDF related to um, the mixer brush action that I've given you, let me show you that. And we will um, do that. This is a start, and this is over in Los Osos, um, uh, up the coast here, Morro Bay area. Light Workshops, any of you ever gone, taken a class at Light Workshops? Lightworkshops.com, awesome school, one of the best digital photography schools in the country. And uh, highly recommend it. So I'm going to do Light, huh? Lightworkshops.com. Helen Victoria Schmidt. Um, they're putting on the California Photo Festival at the uh, end of summer. An excellent um, school, lots of shoots, wonderful stuff. I'm going to do that enhancement, so let's kind of do that same sort of thing that I did before. Let's take that clarity up. We'll take that vibrance up. Okay, you can see I'm going to really exaggerate it. I'm going to go to my graduated filter, okay, and maybe do a little graduated ND effect. You know, darken the sky. Okay, I'm going to come up here, darken my foreground. Okay, come over here, do a little vignette. Again, the class is not really on that, but we'll do just a little, you know, darkening on that. Let's add our contrast and shadow. So that's volume 12, right? So if we come over here, here is our before, after, 
before, after. ACR is bitching, okay? You, once you get it, I, I really wish we could do a whole class on just on ACR. I'm gonna do, again, three days on that. You're welcome, it's free. Tell your friends. Stuff's time, tell your friends. CreativeLive.com. Um, it's a, like webinars, what they do is they, everything at CreativeLive.com is free if it's live. If you watch it and you go, oh, I'd love to own that and keep it, then you buy it and you download it and you own it for life. Okay, so that's how they basically work. Um, but um, I just did a great quote. Um, stops time, tells your, it stops time, tells your friend. It stops time, tell your friends. What is that a quote from? What? No, close? Dr. Horrible sing-along blog. Yes, yeah, freeze ray, stops time, tell your friends. If you have not seen Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog, get with it, guys. Do a search. It's free. Dr. Horrible's sing-along by Joss Whedon, who did The Avengers and um, who did Firefly. I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands for Firefly, because if you guys haven't watched it, you should be leaving right now, okay? <laughs> if you're not a brown coat, you should just go. Okay? Best thing that was ever done on TV. Okay, so that is volume 12. Okay, so totally take it up. Actually, let's, instead of that doing that, let's do this. Okay, we're going to do this, and I'm going to frame the image in white using a vignette. So if you take down your midpoint and roundness and feather, you can frame. The reason why I'm going to do that is that white frame, when I paint, I can now pull in the white of the canvas into it, or in the case, imitate as if my paint is fading off into the white of the canvas. So this is that enhanced step. That was in that outline. Okay, so I'm going to come up here, open object. Great. And actually, let's do this. I'm going to actually do, because it's not related to smart objects, I'm going to go ahead and flatten that layer. So it's just a good old dumb pixel fill layer. And I'm going to run an action, and this is an action that I'm giving to you all. It is beta. There is no tech support. Okay. Later on, I'm going to do an entire title. Um, whether it'll be through Photoshop Cafe or my own publishing or through Creative Live, I'm still not sure. But I'm giving it to you here, and that's why I'm walking it through. It is called Davis Mixer Painting Setup Beta. Okay. Disclaimer: Don't come to me crying. <laughs> <coughs> I'm, I'm giving you guys a ton, everything I possibly can. I'm giving you guys for free. So Davis Mixer Brush Setting. You hit play, and it's going to walk you through the process. All my actions, they don't do anything secret. They leave all your layers intact. It explains that they're for teaching purposes. I'm not trying to hide anything. So it walks you through. So hi, welcome to my rough beta Photoshop CS5. As was originally, it works with CS5, CS6, and CC. If you've already downloaded all three of my Davis Mixer Brush presets, hit continue. If not, stop, install them, and restart. I mentioned before, everything that's in that little presets folder that you can download, you're going to put it into the presets folder within Photoshop and restart it. Okay? It has to, and I'll do stop here, what it's going to do is, um, like in Actions itself, when you put them into the presets folder and restart it, you won't actually see my presets over here in the panel. What you will do is if you go into the upper right, you'll find my presets available for you down here. In other words, you can load them. If you go over to something like textures, if you come up here and you create a layer here and you want to do a pattern fill layer, after you've put my presets into the presets folder within Photoshop's application folder, and you'll find your patterns, and you click on your patterns, and this is where the notorious bubbles and tie-dye live, right? <laughs> the, only, the only patterns that Adobe thinks are useful are these two. Don't get me started. Um, you're going to want to find my canvas textures and everything else. What you'll do is you again go up to the upper right. Look, it's in the, and Adobe has been consistent. It's a wonderful interface. Always in the upper right is where you'll find all your options for every dialog, every panel, every window is always in the upper right. You're going to click here, and you're going to find my texture libraries at your disposal. So you can come up here and anything that says wow, load it in. OK? 
Okay, and if you load it in and you go, you know, media patterns, which is what you're going to have, append, and now you have things like my brush strokes and patterns at your disposal. They're very nice. Um, woo yes. So that action says, would you please load the presets in, including the brush presets. Okay, so that we're going to eventually go over to the um, uh, mixer brush over here, mixer brush, and you're going to find my wow mixer brushes in here. How are you going to find them? You're going to go to the mixer brush up here in the upper right, and you're going to find the wow um, custom art crop. I don't have them. I don't have the presets into the presets folder, but you'll find the um, wow mixer brush ones I've already loaded in here. That's where I created them. Um, the reason is, is that this action, going back to our actions palette, when you hit play, when we hit the these ones and you all sorts of ones, and you hit play, presupposes that you have that loaded because this is actually going to choose the brushes for you. It'll choose the patterns, the textures, where well, you're going to see what it does. It also will walk you through, because if you started this without doing that enhanced step, it's going to walk you through the dialog boxes to do brightness, contrast, color, tone, vibrance. It'll walk you through how to basically make your images hurt your eyes. Right? We're, we're, we're making them radioactive. This is what that action did. It created the entire document for you, took your original, took all the layers that you're going to paint on, gave you a nice little cheating trace page for you to have so you can trace images. It also put the actual photograph here so you can actually see the photograph here. And if we look at what the, they're called, reference for tracing outline, reference for tracing photo, <coughs> it automatically, you've got a backup that you're not going to need. It's not turned on. You've got a pattern, which is the canvas you're painting on. It's going to give you rough painting, refine the painting, painting details, final highlights, final shadows. If you've ever done real painting, you know that you don't just paint what you see. If you've got the, the proverbial flower pot here, you want to come in and put a specular highlight on that area. You want to come in with some pure titanium white, and you want to hit it as if it's a highlight. Well, there may not have been a highlight there, but that's your story. You want to be able to have a highlight which is, in this case, all of this is cloning from the photograph, is a lighter version of your original photograph. This is a darker version of it. So you can paint and clone exactly what you saw, and you can also paint um, what you didn't see, in other words, lighter or darker. You have one layer here that's for final painting. You'll notice it tells you this is the one time you're going to change the brush from my WOW A brush to a WOW B brush. This is called a blender. I'll show you that in a second. And, um, and that's it. So this is what it works. The first one is the rough underpainting. It automatically chose the mixer brush for you, loaded in a preset, put in all the textures, chose all these settings for you, including it took off sample all layers. So I have an empty layer that has nothing on it. I have the mixer brush that has no sampling turned on, and yet I can paint with my photograph. Okay? I am having access to my photograph, and I don't have to mix the colors or worry about turpentine or mediums or anything. What is going on here? Okay, that's actually impossible. I can't tell you. I'd have to kill you. <laughs> What's going on here is a little bug, which Adobe has been very nice to not fix, because Last year, when we came in, myself and John Derry, who's an excellent resource, johndairy.com, D-E-R-R-Y. He sells some great brushes and stuff. So John, awesome. Um, what's going on here is this layer that looks like it's empty that I'm painting on here is not empty. It actually has the full photograph in here at 1%. All you need, because is to have that color information there. And transparency in Photoshop, for you engineer geeks, which a number of you are, is based upon what's an alpha channel technology. So you have your RGB, and then your transparency is a separate eight bits of information. It doesn't matter if it's only 1% one, one of the RGB information. I am actually mushing that 1% information. Of course, that I wouldn't see it if the layer was set to 1%. I wouldn't see anything. So what I did using the action is I took an empty layer, took the photograph, set it to 
merged it down to a 100% layer, and I end up with a 1% copy of the photograph. If you go, huh? Don't worry about it. I've given you an action. Okay? <laughs> it's awesome. It's great. It's cool. We'll explain it later. Okay? You also have, as a backup, another paint layer resource. This has your entire photograph on it. You could duplicate this 50 times if you want. The great thing about this whole concept is that as you move up the, the food chain, so to speak, up here to refine edges, and then you probably take the size of your brush down, you now are not doing a mush of a mush. It's going back to the original photograph. So you can keep going over the photograph as many times as you want, because every single layer is going back to your original photograph. It is a copy of the original photograph. Okay, so when I come up here, I'm not mushing. And because I don't have sample all layers, it's really fast. Okay, if you try to do that with sample all layers turned on, it's a huge amount of processing power that needs to take place. So it's fast, it's quick, it's easy, it's non-fattening. Why not? Do it. It's awesome. Tell your friends, stops time. Okay. Uh, freeze ray. Um, so we're going to come over here. I'll do, you know, real quick. So you can see the colors. Now you can see why I went iridescent, you know, went all Van Gogh on this. Okay, so now you can see now where Darth Maul comes in. The dress for the dress for Princess Diana. I could get all ex expressive in that situation. I want to lighten up certain areas. I'm going to jump right to final highlight and paint on that. This is a lighter version of it. I want to do shadows. I go to the shadow layer, and I'm now painting a darker version of the actual photograph. So it's still those colors. I've shifted the palette to both lighter and darker. Cool, awesome. <laughs> Last thing as we're coming in, because we're actually, this, is, this ends at 2.30, right? Yep. We're already over. Last thing here is it would be really neat if I came up here and actually added that final blending. So you come over here and switch to the WOW Blender. And this is where you're actually going to tie in these photographs. And this one actually is sampling all layers. And that is going to um, allow you to take all these different layers and um, unify them by coming in here and doing subtle blending or extreme blending or you know whatever you want to do. So the blending is a step. It tells you what brush to use. You just get to this step. So you're working bottom to top. You come over here, do this. The last thing you do here is you simply turn on the top layer. And that top layer is using one of my gesso layers to mess with your mind. So it's adding in these brush strokes. And you can actually come over here and change it from medium to large. You can change the scale on it. You can actually move the pattern throughout. It sets the blend mode for you. You can scale it down to 75% or whatever you want. So this is that final step I mentioned about adding a patina or a texture or whatever. So that, and I even made a layer mask for you to selectively make it so it kind of goes in and out of visibility, which you can also change. Okay. Wow, exactly. Copyright trademark. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, you guys have got the link. One, in terms of evaluations, please make a nice evaluation because I'm trying to brown nose you to get a nice evaluation because I got this really cool Max Master teacher thing. So, that lets me sit in the front row of the keynote. Questions? Any questions about anything? I can put those links back up. Yes. OK, the link is going to be right here. OK, it's that first one. It's going to be that facebook.com, Jack Davis Wow. Like the page and look for the star. Like the page, look for the star. It says freebies, right? And it's that standard. I, I kept it the same logo. That's uh, Facebook, like it, and then you get access to the painting ones. Other questions?